ಹಾಗಾದ್ರೆ Hey, Lionel. Hey, Lionel. Hey, Kaylee. Hey, Lionel. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, we should start a, a model railroad podcast. It's like, uh, you know, those uh, hipster AM radio stations from the 70s and the 60s. You know, it might actually do really well. Yeah, it might, eh? You know. It, it could be one of those, like, those old radio TV pr- uh, radio programs, like Orson Welles' War of the Worlds. Yeah. I exactly or uh, Bob. I'm I, I've actually listened to some of the Bob Hope shows. Oh, yeah, it, it, people actually get. I I have I have images of model railroaders all around the world getting together on Tuesdays, and they gather around their phone and they all listen to the podcast together. <laughs> Just like those uh, old uh, black and white photos where yeah, everyone's yeah. around the radio. Yeah, the old radio. Or what do they call them? The Motorola, but they call them radio radiola or something. I don't know. Um, the that, RCA Victor- Victoriola. Yeah, like that. that's it. Yeah, you know everything. Holy mackerel. How come you know so much stuff? Does your head hurt because it's got so much stuff in it? Oh, there's a pretty big noggin. Got to fill it up with something. Uh, all right. Uh, now I have a giant melon and I got nothing in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, your story air. That's yeah, the important thing. Exactly. Yeah. In case there's an oxygen shortage, I got plenty. Exactly. I exactly. Got, so when the, when the, when everybody's gasping for breath, you'll be sitting there just laughing because you got plenty. Yep, exactly. You guys are storing all that information in your head, and I got nothing but pure oxygen. <laughs> um. Uh, so tonight, so uh, for those of you who haven't already guessed, uh, I'm speaking. My name is the Evil Overlord, and I'm speaking with uh, Kaylee Zhang, who is the nutmeg gir- uh, the, the the superintendent of the nutmeg division of the NMRA. Mm-hmm. She's the photo chairman of the northeastern region of the NMRA. Mm-hmm. She works at Tom's Trains, and sometimes she does pricing. She installs a lot of decoders. Mm-hmm. She can't say no to most people. Sadly. She likes to go on hikes. Absolutely. Uh, and and uh, you also have a job that we can't tell anybody. Pretty much. <laughs> and finally... <laughs> Last but not least, she uh, single-handedly builds Pratt & Whitney turbine engines, and then uh, in her right now she's building them in her living room, and then single-handedly installs them on Airbus A320s. With three bolts. With three bolts, yeah. The, how, I don't get any of that. <laughs> hey, as, as long as they're high-grade, high-strength bolts, you're golden. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was doing okay you know they have these things now on uh one of the things you can see on youtube there's two or three guys they make these uh 10 minute long videos about plane crashes uh-huh and i was doing okay you know like i'm interested in playing i'm interested or uh, flying i'm one of those guys i'm terrified and fascinated by it at the same time now it's like it's how cool is it to get this really big machine up in the air and it flies along and it does so cool Mm-hmm. But you know, it's the other. There's the other parts of it, but that doesn't really bother me much anymore. I think I'd be pretty much the guy with my feet face plastered to the window, going, "Wow, this is kind of cool. Look how fast we're going towards the ground." <laughs> <laughs> it's all in perspective. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, anyways, I was watching one of these, and it was about uh, a plane whose engine came off. That's happened a few times, not many. Three or four in the history of aviation, I guess, or probably more than that. But in general, in the in the last few decades, and this is a, uh, the guy's engine fell off, and then they were showing the bolt, and it was like barely like make a half inch thick bolt. And I'm <laughs> thinking, well, there's your problem right there, boys. <laughs> <laughs> but if you make it any thicker, we can't get off the ground. Uh, what's the most? Uh, what would they make that? What would be the strongest metal that they would make that out of? Believe it or not, steel. Really? Just, mm-hmm. but it must be super. I mean, they always do that hairline. They always do, you know, they test it for hairline cracks, but it must be oh, super, mm-hmm. super duper strength steel or something. Oh, very hard steel. Yep. Hmm. 
All right. So you know why we're here tonight? Um, well, I heard some muffling coming out of the green room. Does that mean we have somebody here? Yeah, somebody's here. And I'm actually kind of nervous. And I'm going gonna, gonna to tell you why. Okay. This, this I've heard this guy's name for years. Mm. I'm thinking decades. And, and he's a well-respected modeler. And he's one of the people that I've always I always try to steer away from because uh, because I was in Model Railroad and I had a column. They would tend to think that I know stuff, so I would never want to talk to this guy because he would think, "Hey, I can I can he can talk to me on the same level," and I'd be like, "No, I, <laughs> I'm not. I <laughs> I know I know I know two types of woodland scenics: ground foam and RS ones, and that's about where where it stops." <laughs> <laughs> that's all you need right Is, yeah, exactly. isn't that pretty much the hobby right so, there so uh, one on the one hand i'm kind of nervous talking to this guy because this is an interview that you have arranged and you've done that quite a few times which actually i very much appreciate so i'm really really excited to talk to this guy but at the same time i'm kind of nervous because at the end i'm afraid he's going to think i'm just a complete doofus well you are my dim-witted half-brother so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly how come you understand that but nobody else does all right, so the guy we're going to talk to is David Ramos, who, if you're in the hobby at all, you know this name. He's been published numerous times. Mm -hmm. And he has a be beautiful, uh, well-oiled machine for a layout, too. And and he's kind of like a boxcar, or he's a freight car aficionado, is he not? He does have, have over a thousand freight cars, and that's on a low-end count. Yeah, and he enjoys building them and all that kind of stuff. And so let's get him in here. And what should be the first question we ask him? Hmm. Does he have water in the layout? Yeah. Or or how many freight cars does he have? There we go. All right. Okay. Uh, can you uh, tell him to come on in here? Sure. Let me go get him. Mr. Ramos. Mr. Ramos. Paging Mr. Ramos. Ah, I'm here. What's up? Uh, Dave, my name's Lionel. Yep. We've never formally met. No, uh, we actually pass each other at uh, Springfield a couple of times. Well, I, you you couldn't hear it because you were in the green room. But in reality, when I see it coming, I kind of like duck the other way or I look away so that we don't make eye contact. Yeah, it's my bald head. It reflects light really well. No, I'm afraid you're going to ask me hard questions and I'm just, I don't, I'll screw well, them up. That's okay. I mean, uh, no one no one knows everything. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you got to have fun figuring out what you don't know. <laughs> Have you listened? I'm assuming you've listened to the pod every episode of the podcast and some of them twice. Yes, I've listened to the Phil Monat one, and I um, when I saw him, I I I slapped him for you. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, Dave uh, Barraza and I went to uh, Pro Rail last year, and we spent um, I would say 18 hours in the car there and back. You know, nine hours each way, and in which case, I I spoke to him. Uh, about your uh, podcast afterwards, because uh, after that trip, and it's like, I, I looked at him and said, we spent 18 hours in the car together. And I didn't know half about you that I learned from the podcast you did uh, on Modeler's Life. I'm like, he says, you're so quiet. <laughs> <laughs> See, so we do that. We do uh, provide a service. Yes. All right. So, uh, Dave, I, I know you na your name from... Oh, the first question we're going to ask is, how many freight cars do you have? Uh, I got about 1,200, maybe 1,240 uh, built, about 980. And this is HO scale? All HO scale. There is one O scale car, and whenever I find it, I'll probably put it on eBay. And uh, are they, they're not all on the layout, are they? Uh, they all cycle through, um, mostly because I've operated on so many different layouts that never cycle their their equipment and um it got to a point i could tell you what because i have a photographic memory for certain things and um one of them is box cars so when i'm i'm on some of the layouts i, I could tell you what train it is by just the, the concept of cars on it uh unfortunately that layout doesn't exist anymore but it used to be really funny i would look at that and i said oh that's that's this train or that's that train that's the milk train because it's the one with the, all the milk cars and all that, but um, it, it's uh, it's part of my paranoia that uh, uh, the trains themselves on my layout are identical because it follows the prototype schedule. So the way I mix it up is by mixing up the actual cars that come in. So that you never have the same car coming in on the same train. Wow, that sounds like something we got to delve into 
Uh, let's not forget, uh, Kaylee, to get more into that before we're done here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because if we go down that rabbit hole now, then we may never get back to the basics of. Yeah. So, uh, Dave, uh, I'm assuming you're a lifelong. So when was the first time you were published? How about that? Uh, about 10 years ago, I, I, I had an article published in the coupler about the layout. And then um, mostly I have more photographs published um Recently, there was uh, the great crash at the uh, at uh, Cayugi at uh, Tony Custer's layout that I took the picture of, which made it to MR and actually made it into a couple of issues of MR huh. with uh, with uh, train number ten coming into train number forty five at Cayugi head face first. You know, so that's a, that's a picture that's been published, and I've had a couple of articles published about my waybill system. All right, and how it works. Um, I use a more prototype way bill system, so I have to explain it. So uh, I explained it so many times, I figured, let me write an article about it. And so when somebody comes to the layout, I just send them the article. Perfect. And But I know your name from forever. You must be somebody, Kaylee, is it a name that people uh, refer to on a regular basis? Because it just seems like I know that name forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah. And Dave is actually very uh, well known amongst the, uh, um, uh, shoot, what was it called? Prototype meets. Oh, okay. There are RPMs. The RPMs. Yeah. Have you, have, you know, that one, that, uh, there's that NERPM one. Excuse yeah. The, yeah. Excuse you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and I think I remember him saying, so the, the, the main organizer said that they'd rather go to the green yeah. for the RPM. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a little, that was a little awkward. <laughs> but uh, Dave Owens, we speak uh, kindly of Dave Owens. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So good uh, man. Yeah, he is a good man. And uh, so, uh, yeah, Dave. I know. I've known your name for years. Uh, how, uh, can I ask you how old a man you are, gentleman you are? Uh, well, I'm. I just turned fifty-seven this year of the pandemic. Okay. Um, and um, so yeah, so hope, yeah, been, should be able to make it up to ninety. That's my family history to make it into our upper nineties. Good. Unless there's a world war, because that usually is what takes us out. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I hope you've invested well. Um, So have you been a lifelong model railroader? Well, I I started when I was a kid. I was given a Tyco um, uh, Jupiter set, which uh, if there's anybody from Tyco listening, um, it got me out of model railroading for a few years because it wouldn't run well on straight track, let alone curves. And that was my first (laughs) four by eight. And then uh, I became an athlete. I played baseball in high school and college, and I destroyed both my knees. So I needed something to do that didn't require my knees to uh, to to run. So I got back into model railroading. I had some really good friends um, who got me back into the hobby. Uh, I oddly enough, I was a big traction fan when I first got into it. Um, and then I discovered that I really like operations and because. Uh, uh, there are very few operating traction layouts that there are. There's a couple of really good ones. There's one O scale one here in New Jersey, uh, Tom Piccarello's and, yes. uh, that I go to. And besides that, I mean, I, I really enjoyed attraction I'm, and I just never saw it as a modeling opportunity for, for myself. I really grew up in New York city in the sixties and seventies. And, uh, I remember, uh, growing up on the East side, and watching the boats going in and out of uh, the old Domino Sugar plant, and seeing the they had a steam engine there. As a matter of fact, they still I think it's still rotting there. Wow! Uh, and uh, I remember seeing it, and that's when I got hooked as a small kid. And uh, we moved out to Queens, which is uh, basically a more livable part of New York City. It's not you know like everybody <laughs> living on top of each other. And I got into uh, the. Uh, I got into the clubbing scene. I got into the NASA Model Railroad Club, and that's where I got really introduced into prototype uh, operations and all that. Not from the club itself, because it was whatever could run ran, but the whole idea of um, operations, making everything work, um, trying to make sure you had standards. And that was my, uh, that's, it turned out that's something I really enjoyed. And um, I became uh, enamored of operating. And then after that, I started doing that in my twenties and I've been doing it like for almost uh, 30 years since then. So, okay. So you say friends got your back into the hobby. Like how old were you when that happened? 
in my 20s, in my 20s, because, you know, uh, the typical male cycle in model railroading is you discover it as a, as a child and you go off to school, you discover uh, members of the opposite sex, and then um, you go back to trains eventually. And uh, I have children now, so uh, I have two daughters, so I needed a place to escape. So I'm in the basement working on my trains while they're upstairs yelling at each other. So it's a, it's a win-win. So and and you've been you still live in Queens? No, I I live in New, in New Jersey now. I live in in a place called Clifton, New Jersey. It's I like to call it scenic New Jersey. Um, <laughs> Is there such a uh, thing? Isn't that like an oxymoron? Yeah, Is that an actually, oxymoron? Hey, well it can't. It, well, it can be, but petro, you know, as they said in that movie, petrochemical state doesn't fit on the license plate. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, it's as, actually one of the interesting things is like uh, New York and, and New Jersey have a perception in the in the United States of every. If you say New York, everybody thinks Manhattan. If you say, think of New Jersey, everybody thinks of uh, Newark, right? Or or Elizabeth with all the chemical plants. But it's very diverse. It's uh, some of the most amazing buildings that I've ever seen have been in New York and New Jersey that have not been in the city. Um, it's got beautiful environmental spots, you know, like, uh, uh, there's some beautiful lakes and mountains, although being in the Northeast, people think what's a mountain is not, people in the West would say that's a hill. Yeah. So, I mean, but, uh, I lived in Rockland County for a few years, so, uh, I like the topography of like the Bronx and stuff like that. And, uh, I've always been interested in, uh, modeling New York, uh, the New York Harbor, New York area, because it was, um, very gritty. Yeah, I would highly rec. I was just gonna say I would highly recommend for anybody. I like going to New York City. I like driving in downtown New York City because I feel like the only rule about driving in New York City and Manhattan is don't hit anybody hard. Don't get caught. Yeah, don't get caught. Yeah, or don't hit anybody <laughs> hard. And uh, uh, I I think being in New in Manhattan and New York City and that whole uh, urban area is uh, is a is a part of you know, a part of the world that you want to explore and because it's a, it, it's an exciting place to be. Like maybe, okay, that's not where you want to live, but it's some place you definitely want to be familiar with. Well, I grew up in the city and I have to tell you, it's, I didn't have a car. I never had a license until I was in my twenties. Uh, you don't need a car in, to live in New York city, but I have to tell you, it was an exciting place to grow up, especially in the seventies and eighties. It was not the safest place to grow up. Uh, but it was an exciting place. It was the city that never sleeps. It still is, although now with the pandemic, it kind of naps. Um, All right. Um, what I found really interesting is I had to go into our offices during the middle of the pandemic and to retrieve some hardware. And what normally would have taken me hours, I was in and out of the city in 35 minutes, including going through the tunnel, parking, going upstairs to the sixth floor of the building, finding the equipment, getting back in the car and driving back to my office. Wow. I, I couldn't have done that unless it was three in the morning normally. Yeah, I go to I go to downtown Toronto quite a bit. And uh, I've had the same experience. What used to take me almost two hours now takes me like an hour, like half. I love time. I love Toronto. It, uh, I honeymooned there and I've been there for a couple, uh, a couple other occasions. Um, uh, it's, it's a wonderful city and I actually think it's really funny. A lot of people don't realize it that before Vancouver was the filming capital of Canada, I mean, Toronto was the body double for New York, except us New Yorkers would realize it was way too clean to be New York. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's the home of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yes, that was where my hotel was, right next door to the fabulous uh, garden. There you go. And by now, by the, this will probably be broadcast at the end of 2020 or the beginning of 2021. And mm -hmm. by now, uh, the Leafs will have won the Stanley Cup in the 2020 uh, season. Many A few months ago, the Leafs have since won the Cup and the Stanley Cup and everybody's euphoric and life is wonderful. Or they got knocked out in the first round and things pretty much carried on as always. One of the well, other. Well, unfortunately, I root for teams that end in ETS, and the only year that was the only year that was good for us was 1969, when the Mets won the World Series, the Jets won a Super Bowl, and um, I, I never forget the Nets for trading Dr. J, but the Knicks won the uh, the championship also. So that was a that was a wonderful year to be a kid in New York, and it was a curse because the Nets have never the Knicks have never won, the Nets have never won, the Mets came close. 
and won in 86, but never it teased us a lot. And of course, my New York Jets are known for, will be ever known as the team that had the butt fumble. Yeah, well, yeah, that too, for, with our buddy um, Mark Sanchez, but it's also the home of Broadway Joe. Uh, yes. I'm I'm a Jets fan. That's my NFL team is the Jets. Mm-hmm. O- only because uh, when uh, Joe Namath was at his uh, prime, I was a young uh, young boy, and my dad hated all the long haired hippies, and uh, so then I became a Joe Namath fan, and subsequently a Jets fan since the mid '60s. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, uh, hey Kaylee. Hey Lionel. Hey Kaylee. Uh, that brings up another subject. I don't think we know. Of any particular, we know you've never been to a hockey game, which I have yet to solve. I have yet to rectify that problem. But uh, do you have a particular sports or any sports team that you root for in any particular sport? Well, for football, it's um, Giants because, well, I'm from Jersey and Giants is a Jersey team. Jersey team, even though they try to claim to be a New York team, no, it's it's a Jersey team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Okay, so that's cool. The Giants. You're a New York Giants fan. Yep. And then, as far as foot uh, baseball goes, we have the Hartford Yard Goats. Yeah, I got their hat. So, uh, exactly. I, um, and if you were, and, and if you were up against it, and you had to pick an NHL team, it would be the Hartford Whalers. Exactly. In their in, in their, a heartbeat. Yeah, in a heartbeat. Exactly. Except they got beach. So, well, yeah. there goes that thought. <laughs> So, okay, David, so uh, I got a feeling you're, I'm going to have to, we're going to have to try to pack a lot of information into a short period of time. So, um, it's in, we don't want to skip over operations. We don't want to skip over, let's go back to where we were talking. So you have a layout, let's just get the, the, get the preliminaries out of the way. So you have a layout now called the New York Harbor. Yes. Railroad. Yes. Um, it has an interesting uh, beginning. Uh, and that was in uh, 2006. I basically loaded up my my car and I said, "I'm I'm going to build a layout." Um, incidentally, I've never built a layout before this one. That was not a four by eight sheet of plywood. Um, I worked on a club layout, which is if, if you're familiar with club layouts, is 75 people making a decision that one person actually executes. <laughs> I like that. Uh, nice. One. And then and there's 74 people that disagree. So Too we had sorry. a rule. We had a rule that it had a, it, it, if, even if everybody hated it, it had to stand for a year as long as it operated before anybody could make a change because there was a, almost fisticuffs at one point. Um, so I knew what I wanted. And one of the aspects that I always disliked about going to layouts were if you were running a train and the back end of one of your train was going in and out of the other town while the front end was working the town you were currently in. So train length was important for me. And so, you know, basically having a realistic operation. So in a room that's 22 by 20, um, without putting a helix in, and and basically I almost every single person I have is a friend who was helping me build um, the, the term anti-helix. <laughs> they, nobody likes a helix. Nobody wanted a helix. Everybody talked me out of a helix because every layout that I designed for down here that didn't have that problem had a helix in it. So I was like, no, you can't do it. So um, I was looking for something that I could do that would fit in the room, that would be proper for the room, um, that wouldn't drive me crazy about, you know, like, with, with like, oh, I don't like the scenery and stuff like that. And, and then I remember it as a small kid um, driving on the West Side Highway with my parents. There used to be this uh, yell truck that was about 30 feet in the air. It was sitting on top of a building that was right next to 28th Street Yard. And there was an Erie Yard. At that point, it was Erie Lackawanna. And uh, I remember seeing it as a small kid. And I remember really, well, it wasn't small. It was 1972, so I was eight. Uh, I was yeah, I was eight years old, so I was very very interested in it, and uh, I started doing some research on it, and I had a lot of um, issues about committing to it, mostly because it was it was an engineering nightmare, and uh, build helping build a, a couple of friends layouts, 
Uh, I, I swore I was never going to have the same problems that they were that they had. So I was going to have all new problems. <laughs> so um, which is I think Mr. says don't make old pro- don't make old mistakes, make new ones. And I took that to heart. Right. And so uh, anybody who knew me at the time would know how crazy I was when I was designing 28th Street. I actually designed the bench work so that none of the bench work would be underneath a switch. So if I put a switch machine underneath it, none of the structure would interfere with it. Right. Which is not easy to do because every time I changed the track plan, I had to change the bench work plan. <laughs> so um, this gentleman by the name of Vince Lee, Vincent Lee, who was a teacher in New York City, a uh, college teacher, and uh, Tom Flagg published a art- an article in the Erie Diamond. Um, which is the Erie, Erie Lackawanna Historical Society's uh, publication. Before, about, before we go yeah. on, are, is your membership up to date with that? No, I already built it. I don't need any more magazines. <laughs> <laughs> so, start, that was for you. Yeah, because David, yeah. because David Start, who's the membership chairman, he's like, don't get on his don't get on his bad side because he'll go nuts. Like, don't send him a check and make sure you fill out the forms correctly because he's just he's yeah, a, he's a madman. No, I like David. David's not a problem. If I, if I realized, I guess some of the guys I knew were in charge, I wouldn't give them my money. <laughs> all that. But if it's Dave, I'll give him money. So it's not a problem. Uh, but so I got really interested in it. And then I have a friend of mine who's named Jay Held, who's who's um, who's basically he's the bag man for uh, the EL Society. He basically is the guy. If you ever go to a, a, a RPM meet. And the EL tables there. He's 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 got the members only jacket. We we swear he has a shipping container full of them, and <laughs> um, he's always you know where most people will bring a you know like a a couple of magazine, we bring several hundred magazines to sell, um, and stuff like that. So, but and he's a, he's a real good egg, he, and he's um, but he's a really bad influence. He's the one reason why I have so much in the basement is because he, oh you have room. <laughs> that's that's the worst thing you could tell me because then I'll I'll engineer it. Uh, so I found this article and I, I befriended uh, Vince Lee, who actually built the 28th Street. He built it out of commercial track, and is this whole cadre of uh, 28th Street modelers that I never knew existed. And I started publishing my uh, my work on my website and started publishing. Uh, there was no Facebook at the time. Um, and I started going to RPM meets and discussing what I was doing. And then it's like, it was like all of a sudden somebody turned on the light and all these people just came out and started talking about what the, the, they remember it or they were on the Jersey side. And I actually met a few people who actually worked in the yard, a gentleman by the name of Jim Kosovo, who I was introduced to by um, uh, Vince. And uh, you, want, want I mean, me to, you want me to get that for you? No, I just I just muted it. I forgot to mute the one phone down here. Sorry can, about that. Can you do me a favor? If that's Hollywood calling, just take a message for me, will you? That's okay. They uh, they are, I've already been cast by David Hasselhoff. He's going to play <laughs> me in a movie. <laughs> Apparently, you don't own a mirror in your house. No, I can't. I have a I have a I, I have a bald head. It, the reflection would kill me. It's like the it's like Medusa. I have to have uh, those glasses to darken when I'm doing more of the not. It would, be very very dangerous um if you get me and a few of my friends together we you know we parabolic mirror there yeah yeah <laughs> but, power the world oh yeah so there's um there's an interesting story about me just before i built the uh, uh the okay layout. okay hang on a minute uh you haven't obviously listened to all the episodes we have kind of a rule uh-huh uh kaylee will back me up on this and and she's pro she's one of the leads in this department uh, we decide if your stories are interesting or not. Okay. You tell them, it, and then then we'll tell you if it was interesting. Okay. It, it involves the, my good friends deciding that the um, the the Hispanic kid had to try scotch. <laughs> you know what? You know what? Hey, Kaylee, I don't know if we've ever done this or not, but I, I'm I'm good. I'm already. I, this sounds interesting to me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm good to go. Anything with scotch is good to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So my one of my one of my closest friend who retired and moved to Reno, um, his name is Tom Callen. Everybody knows him as Short Man from Short Line Hobbies. Um, he's 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 basically one of the reasons why this layout got built and why I, I got a lot of I got introduced to a lot of people. He's he's also one of the people who who 
basically says, I'm going to Springfield, whether I could afford to, could afford to or not. He was one of the people always saying you're going. So, um, he decided to be really interesting to see if the rum drinker could drink scotch. Now I could drink rum like there's no tomorrow. It's my native drink. I mean, it's like me drinking water as, uh, <laughs> as somebody people, as some people says rum is my mother's milk. You know, it's like, I, I could just drink it. No problem. <laughs> so, so I had a glass. Gone. Yeah. So I had a glass, a single solitary glass. Of course, you know, it was like a double at, uh, at this, at the bar at, um, the uh the malvern hotel if you're familiar with it it's 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 the they had the malvern rpm from the philly division they had there's a bar at the hotel and every year something every time they have a, a shame dig there something strange happens whether it's a bridesmaids fight which happened one year <laughs> um you're looking at my boyfriend slap Bridesmaids flying over the table. Wow. Uh, a guy ordering 50 pizzas and, and then forgetting about it. And the guy showing up with the pizzas uh, or the night that I tried scotch. And uh, there was a few people there. Tom Smeter was there. who's who's, who's building a massive DLNW uh, layout. Um, Ralph Heiss is there. Uh, Ted Diorio, basically the usual sp- suspects. And Tom, who decided that David has to try not just any scotch, but an 18 year old McAllen. And I'm sitting there and I'm drinking it. And within like three sips, I went from this guy who could drink like a fifth of uh, rum and not be affected to, I love you, man, (laughs) in one glass. And it was really funny because I'm sitting there and everybody was telling me that. I'm like, no, that wasn't me. You know, the next day, that wasn't me. I never said that. But But Tom goes, well, actually, you did. So I had to take their word on it. And then, you know, on my deathbed, they'll say, we were just kidding. But um, uh, I made a fool. I've made a fool of myself, which wouldn't be the first time, but it was very funny. It was the first time on alcohol. And um, so it was like really funny because it's like every doubt I had about building the layout. I, you know, I was literally everybody was like the bartender psychiatrist and they all convinced me that it was a good idea and it was going to work. And then, um, the uh then the police came <laughs> the police came <laughs> the police came because it was yet another barroom fight uh this one i think was sisters arguing about which one was looking at her boyfriend or something like that it's if you go to malvern and you go to bed early and you don't go to the bar you're really missing out on some real quality entertainment all right <laughs> it's not like the the like the uh the n-e-r-p-m the narpum that we try and tip the bartender, but she slams the bar doors close on us. Yeah, Here's a at tech the old one. At the old yeah. one, not at the new one. Yeah. The new one's awesome. Yeah. yeah, if you run a hotel and you get an RPM meet, let your bartender know that these guys can drink. <laughs> and that they will be well compensated if they just stay open. Ah, uh, okay. So it was like one of those things. We had we had a ball. It was a lot. It was a lot of fun. So that night, like I said, uh, I bared my soul about whether or not this was going to work. And that was 2008. And then we got into serious construction. Um, we had 28th Street. It was a group effort, about six of us. We got 28th Street built in, I would say, six months. Right. And uh, we got it fixed and operating in about two years. Because when constant, when rubber meets the road, when, when, you, when you have an idea and you never hand laid a switch, or you've hand laid two. And you never hand laid track, and now you're handling uh, an 800 by 200 um, uh, foot square foot yard in HO scale. All of a sudden, things become real. And then um, I learned a valuable lesson, and that is Atherin car doors are two feet thick and will not pass each other in 13 foot centers. Okay, they go they go clunk. So. Uh, a lot of the cars ahead at that point were Atherin cars, so we had to actually move one of the tracks an eighth of an inch. So thirteen uh, th- thirteen foot centers is standard, is it in a yard? In this yard, it was because I actually had the blueprints, and we and I and um, I don't know, maybe it was the Scots. I'm blaming the Scots that I had to be a prototype Nazi at this point, right? And I had to follow everything to the exact specification that the yard had. Uh, the joke was on me because I had uh, I worked at a company that we had architects, and I gave him the blueprints that I have, which was a, a 1964 uh, valuation map that had measurements, and he converted that to HO scale for me. 
and I printed it out on a plotter. It was later on that I discovered that he was terrible at math and I was 10% off. (laughs) So my 13 foot centers were really like 12 foot and a half. So is this this architect that's bad at math? Has he built anything else? Oh, yeah. Mostly parking lots. And so if you're in a parking lot and it's terrible, he built it. Oh, okay. (laughs) I could say the name of the company, but we left on, let's say, I left there on not such gracious terms. So uh, that's another story which requires more scotch. Okay. But um, what, so basically we spent all this time building it and um, the New York Central turn was an afterthought. It was basically uh, the whole layout was supposed to be Erie's 28th Street with a building called Terminal Stores. And uh, Terminal Stores was was basically going to be serviced by the New York Central, which it wasn't a prototype, and Erie, and eventually the Lehigh Valley. But the Lehigh Valley had what I would consider the switch from hell, which was a number four double crossover with a number four double slip. And um, so I had to build two number four double slips, and that wasn't happening at that point because I could barely build a turnout at the time. At this point in time, I could probably do a turnout in my sleep. So and I, how did you? Apparently, I have. How did you learn to build turnouts? Uh, building hundreds of them. I built them for my layout and several other layouts. I was using fast tracks jigs, and after I understood, it was I had that aha moment of how to figure out how to tr- uh, take the the technology that fast tracks employed on how to build it and how to convey that to different size switches and different okay. uh, radi- radiuses and all that. And after I realized how they were engineered and I understood how they were engineered, it became easier for me to do. It's still trial and error, but rail is pretty cheap. So it was, right. you know, if I made a mistake, I just tore it up and there's nothing solder couldn't fix. Right. And so do you, you don't use the fast tracks? Uh, they're not jigs, they're fixtures, by the way. Yes, fixtures made yeah. in your lovely country of Canada. Yeah, uh, and uh, and and sold by our buddy Kevin Hardpart Marks. He would be he's uh, he would go crazy if I didn't correct you about the fixtures yeah. thing. So do you still? So you don't use the jigs anymore? Or the, <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I, you were saying I, yeah, 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 I, the fixtures. Yes, the fixtures. I use the fixtures uh, for the New York Central because those were all number six turnouts. Right. But um, and then for a couple of turnouts. On um, 27th Street, which is the Lehigh Valley, uh, but most of the turnouts, all of the turnouts, with you know, all of the turnouts on 28th Street are all hand laid custom turnouts. Um, most of them, the um, and you just self you just self taught yourself to do this, basically uh, using the, using the fixtures, starting with the fixtures, and then well, kind of- 28th Street was a group effort. There was about three of us working on it. Um, we would do it like once or twice a week. And it was basically an education by fire. So uh, how many yeah. guys do you have working on your layout? Uh, at that point, we had about eight. Really? So we got a lot of, yeah, we got a lot of stuff done really quickly. And a lot of stuff had to be redone really, really quickly <laughs> again. <laughs> what? And the most important lesson is do not think that people understand what you are want, what you want them to do. Right. Unless you have belt and suspenders and basically said, this is what I want. This is the drawing of what I want. This is how I want it done. I left uh, the crew alone for about 25 minutes. To, I think it was 40 minutes while I went to Home Depot to get some supplies. When I came back, there was a 16-foot uh, section that was built. And uh, I lived with it for about a year, maybe two years. And when I did uh, some reconstruction, because uh, when I finally interpreted the the blueprints correctly, I realized that I had made a major mistake and I wanted to correct it. And I did. And this is where... Uh, the Nabisco and the um, merchant's uh, refrigerating is on the high line. It's the structure was incorrect, so I had to correct that. Okay, well, and, let's not get too yeah. far ahead. Let's investigate yeah. this having a crew help you build your railroad because I know that's yeah. an interesting topic for a lot of people. Our buddy Chris Atkins, who's uh, from Argyle, Texas, you know what Argyle, Texas is, don't you, David? Yeah, that's. Um, and I think it's pronounced Argyle, Texas. Okay, but it's uh, <laughs> Argyle, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> It, that, that's like about six feet from the sun, isn't it? No, that's the home of the fighting socks. Yep. <laughs> obviously. obviously. <laughs> you haven't listened to any of these podcasts, have you, David? You've listened no, to I one. You've I listen- listen to, I've listened to three. Oh, three. <laughs> okay. Well, that makes you almost a fan. I say if you get to five, that makes you a fan. 
Well, it, does that make them a stalker at that point? No, if you've listened to five separate podcasts, then I consider you a fan. It's like, uh, you know, if you if you go to a restaurant once and the food's not very good, you'll go back again and and try it. But then if the second time it's no good, you won't go back. Then yeah. I figure a, a fan, when I'm trying to figure out how many actual people we have listening to the podcast, which I'm guessing is somewhere between five and 10,000 fans, and those are up, anybody that's listened to five or more podcasts. So if you listen to two more, you'll be considered a fan. Well, and, Lionel, but yes. the most important question though is, did he turn it off after five minutes? Yeah, exactly. Did you? No, no. I was too. I was in t- for Dave Barraza's one. I was just in too much shock when I had to listen. Shock, for Phil. Yeah, because I learned more about Dave in in that was a <laughs> interview that I known. I've known him for a couple of years. I was. I actually told him that I said I learned more about you in that interview than I knew from meeting you for the past few years. And, and he was like, he said, most people have told him that. Well, and and, and you know why that is? It's the ex- good interview. It's the good. It's the excellent AML interviewing skills. We're a team here. Some of us are kind of dead weight, Scott, <laughs> Scott Thornton. But other than that, <laughs> yeah. um, for, the, I, for the Phil Monat one, I kept on yelling back at the podcast as I said, "Get with the program, Phil." Yeah, I know. I was. Ye- I got to give him another try because I was yelling at him too. But I want to investigate before we get too farther ahead. Uh, I want to investigate this thing about having a crew work on your layout because that was something I a couple of times I had uh, people come over and help me and Bruce. Uh, a moderately agitated male boy helped me and a couple other times. But I, I found the same thing. It's not that they necessarily did bad work. It's just that they didn't do it necessarily the way I wanted. Regar- mm-hmm. Regardless of whether my way was right or not, you kind of have this thing in your head where you're thinking, well, I'd really like it done this way. Yeah. Well, the hardest thing to do is to let go and just to understand what the end point is going to be. Right. How you get to the end point is not as important as getting to the end point, uh, especially with uh, with model railroading. I think the journey is sometimes more important. Uh, the friendships, yeah. the the um, the jokes at somebody's expense, um, the uh, the the food. Um, I used to bribe people to come help me, uh, and it turned out after I was told later on that it wasn't necessary. I always had food. I always had booze. And I always had uh, flying saucers or as people from, from Wisconsin, as I found, found out, call them pinwheels, which are basically uh, a flying saucer is from Carvel ice cream. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but it's two chocolate cookies like Oreo cookies right. with about a quarter pound of ice cream. Uh, and I used to have those in my freezer. And what's really interesting is to watch somebody eat one of those without getting a brain freeze and without waiting long enough for them to turn to soup. So there's a fine line in there. And it, you'd see people stroking their forehead because they ate it too quickly and they had a brain freeze. All right. All right. I'm calling time out right now. Yes. Hang on here a minute. I'm going to check the big board here. Let's see. All right. We're 44 minutes into this thing. I'm calling time out, Kaylee. Uh, this guy's way too interesting and he talks way too fast and we're missing out way too much uh- stuff. I'm from New York. Of course they talk fast. I know, exactly. And we're like, you know, he's talking about pinwheels and this, and I'm like, things are just coming at me at 45 miles an hour. And I'm like, I'm not picking. You got to realize, Dave, I'm yep. just, I'm not that, I don't pick things up that fast. So you got to talk yep. slow. So yeah, I could drink some scotch and then I could, we have a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that, that would be determined. I mean, okay. Yeah. What do you do for a living, by the way? I'm an IT guy. Um, I've been an IT guy for 30 years. I'm the guy who basically, when you break something, I come fix it. Okay. Um, uh, I work for um, for a company called Rent the Runway. And if you don't know what it, what it is, if you're married, ask your wife. She'll tell you what, what it is. It's basically Netflix for high-end women's clothing. And they, um, it's an interesting company. Uh, it's a millennial company. I'm older than most of the employees. I could literally be the parent, 90% of the people <laughs> that work there. And uh, it's kind of hard to, you know, to, to, to bridge that millennial gap. But thank God for them because I have phenomenal health insurance. Uh, rent the runway. Yes. Uh, Dave Barraza, I know you're listening to this. And see, the key is, Dave, 
Uh, in fairness to uh, uh, Dave Barraza, he lets me ask the questions. I, I, you're barely taking a breath here, buddy. You're an interesting guy. There's a lot of stuff to cover here. Uh, rent the runway? I never even heard of that. All right. To be honest, when I submitted my application, I didn't bother to look up to see what they actually did. Because when I was uh, removed from service from my previous employer, Right. Because uh, I aged out and I was, um, I became too expensive. Right. Uh, I was looking uh, for work on with a couple of the search engines that you know that's supposed to help you get a job, and um, the only people that were calling me back were aviation companies, um, mostly because uh, I was old enough to understand the systems that they use, which is kind of scary because this is state of the art. Um, airplanes and uh, yeah. systems and all that and using 40 year old equipment to reg you know for uh, reservations for maintenance logs and stuff like that so I understood how their system worked and I could uh, I could fix most of that equipment I could also do the, the networking and the wiring whatever it took all right time out so, time out uh, Kaylee I don't have a problem with airlines using 40 year old equipment for reservations. Uh -huh. I, I might have a problem with them using 40-year-old equipment for maintenance, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I mean, if they're using paper and pencil, technically that's a thousand-year-old technology. Uh, that's true. I guess so, yeah. So you thought rent, rent a runway was some sort of aviation company? Yeah, I figured, oh, they must they must do either uh, service on the runway equipment or something like that. And then um, I got a call back, and I was like, okay, I got to investigate this. And I'm like, it's a what? <laughs> and I, I, I go to I go to my lovely bride of uh, now 30 years and I look at her and I'm like, have you ever heard of this company? And she goes, I think my your I think our niece rented uh, a dress for her prom from them. So then I got more interested, did, did more research. And um, I have two daughters and a wife. So that means that this could be yet another cost center for me. Um, but uh, it turned out I was a fit. They they I uh, they needed somebody. All right, man, hold on there. Hold on there. Yeah. You're a fit, and I, are we still talking about prom dresses? Yep. Yeah, we, <laughs> hey, you know, it was really interesting that they they discovered that um, men will rent women's clothing too. Not that I have. Yeah, we don't. But, need to, we don't need to I go would, down that road. Anymore. And I, I wouldn't frown upon that because you know we are a free society, and what you do in your own <laughs> private, in your own private abode or on the street is your business. Uh, but, uh, so what's really interesting, Halloween at the company is very interesting. Uh, so, uh, they have costume contests. Uh, a lot of maxi sizes, do they? Yeah. They actually, surprisingly, <laughs> they, they rent everything except for shoes. Um, and so they have, they have sunglasses, they have everything. So it's, they have a lot of men renting for them because they literally have a lot of designer sunglasses and really a sweater is a sweater. Well, sure. You know, and a t-shirt is a t-shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A cuff, a, a, a cardigan, a, a, an argyle, or what do you call those? An uh, argyle and an argyle. No, it's a, a cashmere sweater with puffy shoulders. Is a, uh, That would look good, just as good on a 300-pound man as it would on a 100-pound yeah. woman, for sure. Yeah, you know, I saw Ed Wood. It, it, any director would wear that. And as my, um, as, as a great man once said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. <laughs> Uh okay. Do you have your daughters? What are your daughters' names? Uh, my oldest is uh, Bren, and she's living in Minnesota, so I'm terrified. She's li living in Minneapolis, uh, but she's doing really well. Um, she just got uh, rehired where she was working. She was furloughed uh, during the <laughs> pandemic, and my youngest is M Emily, and she's going to be future dictator of the entire world because she's smarter than anybody I know. Uh, she scored in the top 99 percentile uh, in the um, in her college uh, at pre SATs and all that. And I never knew that West Point recruited until letters started showing up for West Point for my daughter. Wow! And I'm like, uh, since when has West Point recruited? And it's I'm very proud of her, and at the same time very afraid because she's much smarter than I am. So. Uh, she's much smarter than my Ivy League ed educated wife. Right. And so um, I'm the dumb one in the house. So um, they're they're very good. Uh, my daughter is a, a going into her senior year in high school. And uh, hopefully that 
she'll be able to actually go to school instead of doing everything from home. So, the, but, so uh, then the answer to the question would be Bryn and Emily. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't discredit them for not giving you details. That's for sure. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Why are you afraid of Minnesota? Is are you afraid of the Vikings are going to beat the Jets or in the Super no, Bowl? No, giant purple people eaters. Oh, the Minnesota Vikings, the giant purple, giant purple people eaters, and huh. you know. They did have the. They did have a small. They did have some issues there. And uh, what parent wouldn't be uh, worried about their child in this in this current uh, environment? But it's, she's smarter than I am. Like I said, right, I'm the dumb. All right, all right, time out again. They had some issues there. What kind of issues did they have in Minnesota? Minneapolis. There was Minneapolis. The, uh, the, yeah, there was the riots they were having oh, there a few months ago. Okay. All right. Yeah, well, you know. Was she participating? She better not. Okay. Now, could, <laughs> Yeah, actually, for what I understand, is she was the one staying home with the bail money. All right, and you didn't? Did you hear about that whole COVID thing in New York City? Yeah, uh, the, let's not go down <laughs> that thing. Uh, okay, I just wondered because you're you're, con you're concerned I, about Minneapolis, but there seems yeah. to be there was a few problems in the in the Big Apple too. Look, I just lost a hundred pounds <laughs> and just removed myself from all the problematic zones that the COVID nineteen tend to feast on so i no longer or morbidly obese i'm just fat i am no longer a <laughs> diabetic uh i get yelled at by my doctor because my cholesterol level is so low he actually yelled at me eat an egg wow <laughs> and what so, was that's it a, yeah was it in a high tone like was he like eat an egg no, or was it just kind of in a no in I, a if firm... my doctor yeah if my doctor listens to this uh, i'll be shocked first of all because yeah. he's but if he, but wait, he wait, wait, wait a minute, well, you'll be shocked because it's no good, or be, you'll be shocked no, because because he should be learning how to keep me and my wife alive. Oh, all right, uh, okay. The other side of the thing about it is, uh, I literally feel that he's been my doctor since he got out of puberty. <laughs> yeah, why is that? Are you like why? He's very young. He's okay. Very young. Well, how did you lose all? How did you lose a hundred pounds? What was your secret? Staples. St oh, okay. All right. I had, I you went down. Absolutely. You went down there and got a better office chair or something. No, yeah, <laughs> right, basically, yeah. Um, basically, what happened was is that I got to the point where I had to keep on injecting myself with uh, insulin, and I decided this this was not something I wanted to do. And I know too many people who are in this uh, on that treadmill, and you keep on thinking you could lose the weight, and I didn't have the willpower. So that is uh, hard. I met with a, I met with a doctor um, who. Quite frankly, was was a little bit too young to be this good at it, but I didn't listen to myself, and I gave him the benefit of the doubt, and he turns out to be one of the really best surgeons for uh, for this uh, type of procedure. And um, um, okay, it's a it's a long arduous thing, but uh, seven months late, eight months later, I'm 100 pounds less. There you go. And uh, see, I I got confused. I thought you were talking about Staples, the office uh, supply. No, store. no, it's about about forty Staples that they use on your stomach. Holy to, mackerel! To it, yeah, is that one of those big. like uh, an electric staple? Like, P -choo, P -choo. yeah. <laughs> Actually, somebody thought it'd be really funny to send me one on uh, to send me. A, you know, on Amazon, you could buy almost anything. Yeah. Well, somebody sent me a link to the stapler that they use for me on Amazon, oh, and I was go. like intrigued and upset. <laughs> and then it drinks again. <laughs> so the actual stapler or one like the stapler? One like it. Oh, uh, like okay. It. Yeah. What did I send you, Kaylee? I forget. A can of spam? Oh, that's right, too. Yeah. One, <laughs> one night I got bored and I just started sending people stuff from Amazon. Um, okay. Now, I'm, all right, let's get back to this crew thing. How many, uh, so uh, you built, how many guys did you have helping you build this layout? About eight. Um, at one time, usually about four to five would show up. Um, and uh, like I would bribe them with, like I said, booze, food, and um, as much water and uh, soda as they could uh, drink. Um, we'd work for about three or four hours, but in actuality, we worked for like an hour and 10 minutes. And then most of the time, then it would turn to a BS session. Right. Um, and then were, were these guys you knew from the club and stuff or? No, these are these are people who I met over the years at RPM Meet. Some of them I've known for like twenty years. Right. Uh, some of them I've known for five minutes. Okay. Uh, some of them who I'm now I would would consider them almost 
like a like a family member more than a family member at this time. Wow. Um, you know, um, it, it's uh, you build up. That's that's the big thing about model railroading. That if you do it right, you build a lot of camaraderie, a lot of family uh, like ties with people. Uh, and like families, you know, you have your arguments and then, you know, you have your people who who you respect for what they've done in, in both the hobby and r- real world and all that. And uh, the most important thing is not to take yourself too seriously because you're not as smart as you think. And every time I would get a, get a, these guys together, I'd realize how dumb I really was at this okay. and how much I needed their insight. Uh, and the most critical lesson I learned from those work sessions was... Sometimes you're looking at, you can't see the tree through the forest and somebody else will say, Hey, why don't you do this? And this, and this will save you days and all that. Yeah. And it's, it's the most important part as well as, you know, some of these guys I would be willing to go to war with for anything, you know, because, you know, some of them I, you know, won't get coffee for, but like I said, but some of these guys are, you know, have basically, I consider my brother. Now you're going to have to force them all to listen to this podcast when the time comes and they're all going to, you're going to spread the word. They all know who they are. You're going to, they all know who they are. Yes. Yes. Uh, Phil, by the way, <laughs> is one of the guys who built a lot of track for me. All right. Time out, time out, good. time out again here. Kaylee, yeah. you understood what I was saying, didn't you? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Force them to listen. I don't have to force them to do anything. Phil is never going to listen to the, to any podcast. Well, okay. He, but, but it's he, not on the radio. He doesn't get it. Yeah. Well, yeah, he doesn't get it because he doesn't want to. Why are you here? I know. Um, so you're going to say to the guys, Hey, I was on this podcast. Yes, of course. All right. Um, <laughs> before we run out of time, Kaylee, did, did I, are you mad at me or something? No, there's just so much good information. I'm scribbling like mad, trying to take notes. All right. I thought maybe you were mad at me. So you said, let's interview Dave Ramos. (laughs) Hey, Kaylee. Kaylee, Did you, did you realize that that we had a spy in our group? A spy? A spy? Yeah. From Bachman. A Bachman spy? Yeah. What's that? Bachman's coming out with the poultry cars. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, Kaylee. I'm like. Kaylee, isn't uh, our buddy Matt Dawson in England, isn't he building a Lego uh, poultry car? Indeed he is. Has he, has he gotten any chickens lately? He's got many chickens. Oh, okay. Lego chickens. Hi, Matt. How you doing, buddy? Um, so, is it, so is it instead of buck, buck, buck? Is it <laughs> buck? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Except that they, once again, insist on painting the fake chickens on the side of the, on the inside of the car. Well, the Bachman one's not really accurate anyway, so yeah, that's not even remotely close to being accurate. And uh, uh, if a guy in a uh, red, uh, if a guy in a red uh, two, 1995 uh, Cadillac Eldorado shows up at your house, uh, he's probably not too happy about that whole Tycho comment. That's okay. <laughs> I take. I'll, I'll take him. Bring him on. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> This guy, this I lost a hundred pounds. I can go all day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, we better not waste that much more time here because uh, you planned your layout. I see you did that layout tour live on Facebook. Yes, I was asked to by a couple of my friends who really miss coming out. Um, one of them who is um, not allowed to leave the house, uh, and I don't blame him because he's of a certain age and he's uh, has certain risk factors and his wife has certain risk factors. So he says, Hey, I missed the layout. Can you do something? And I, so I kind of did it for him. Yeah. So, uh, so he, it, he misses the camaraderie of uh, the hobby. That and my scotch. Yes. Yeah. And have you told him about the podcast and all the people he could listen to about model railroading? Actually, he listens to a bunch of the podcasts. All right. A bunch of them. Was- uh yeah, he listens to yours religiously. He oh, listens okay. to All right. he um he's the one who told me about Dave's uh, Dave being on your podcast and what, then um, what's his name? And, does he have a name? I can't I, I can't divulge that name. Does it's, he have a does he have a first name? Yes, Tim. Hey Tim, how you doing, buddy? Tim, uh, I don't, whatever your last name is, we're saying hi. Your your Dave Ramos's friend, and of course Dave Barraza, who told me everything about that I need to know about being on here. Yeah, there you go. He gave you a primer about it. Dave's the no, good. actually he did. Dave's, uh, we got to get Dave back on here. Dave's always talking. Uh, Dave always has lots to say on the podcast. Yeah, Dave, I've been, I finally got to his layout because it's like, um, it's like 90 miles and $40 in tolls from my house. Okay. Well, that's because you yeah. live on the other side of Manhattan. 
Yeah, well, you have to pay the uh, the ex- the extortion to pass the city of New York. Well, and if you went to Buffalo, New York, you'd have to pay one hundred and thirty-two dollars in tolls to go that way. That's just part of life, Dave. No, 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 no. I beg to differ. There's a free way to go. Well, if you- my daughter went to horseback riding camp just outside of, B- of Buffalo, um, and I learned how to get to Buffalo without taking the throughway because. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And why doesn't that surprise me? Well, because <laughs> because uh, the New York State through had a special dispensation when they were building it to use New York State materials to, for the highway, and which is which is why most of the people who uh, who are engineers told me that's why it keeps on falling apart. Okay, so why didn't you take it? Because it keeps on falling apart. Oh yeah, well it's it's always in a state of being rebuilt. Uh, so I took, uh, which is actually a beautiful road. Uh, 17, which is now what, 96? They're going to change it to uh, Interstate 96 in New York or 94, something like that. Um, the southern, you pass a lot of, yeah, the southern tier. The southern you, tier. Yeah, and you pass a lot of um, railroad stuff, which you don't pass on the uh, on the throughway. Right. And my lovely wife, who forgives me for all my railroad trespasses uh, and trespassing, um, we uh, we we vacation. I told you before we've been to Toronto, Toronto, right? Yeah, a few Tor- times. Toronto. Yeah, there's no second T. I understand. And um, so we went uh, to Thunder Bay, and we picked it by she picked it by throwing a, a dart at a map of the of North America, and wow. we went there. And what is in Thunder Bay? You may ask. The end the of CP- Lake, the end of uh, uh, Lake Superior. Yes, but also the CP uh, paint shop. Okay. And the CP grain marshaling yard, where there's, I swear to God, thousands of tracks there. And the year we were there was 1997. And that's when the Canada uh, Centerflow hoppers were, were, were just out uh, and in service. So they had all these wonderful Alberta cars with all the fabulous paint schemes on them and, and all that. So she looked at me and says, you knew there was a railroad here. I said, you picked a spot. You knew that there was a railroad here. It's, I'm like, you picked the spot. So um, she always says, no matter where we go, I find trains. So what's your wife's name? Janice. There you go. Hi, yeah, Janice. Janice. Can I say hi to Janice? Well, I bet you I know her last name. Uh, I, I guess you might know half her last name. It's siphonated. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah. All right. But what's really interesting is she is a real good sport because with the pandemic and having to get a new refrigerator this year, I forgot our 30th anniversary. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Uh, you don't happen to know two guys in uh, uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, do you? Uh, yeah, I actually know a couple of people from Green, Green Bay, Wisconsin. I know um, Ted Pamperin, oh, yeah. who actually has tickets to the Packers. Okay. And when they go to the playoffs, he sells the, the playoff tickets because he's in. He he doesn't like. He, well, his idea of cold and my idea of cold are two separate things. And um, because you know, he's, you know, when you're from Wisconsin, negative six is 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 brisk. Right. To me, I'm wearing a parka and three three sweaters and long johns and all that, and he's like in shorts. But uh, I know him, and um, he's also built. He built a fabulous uh, CNO layout. He's part of the CNO contingent in New Jersey. Yeah, he's not in. He's not in. Uh, he's not in um, Green Bay anymore. No, no, he's he's in New Jersey. He's, yeah. he's uh, he lives in uh, uh, Mohawk, yeah. Lake Mohawk. Right, Dave. Dave, you don't know these two guys yeah. from Green Bay. <laughs> yeah. If you, so, who are they? Uh, do I have to do I have to wear uh, like protectors for my knees now? Uh, there are a couple of knuckleheads. Uh, their names are Spoon. Uh, his nickname is Spoon, aka um, uh, Mike uh, Ostertag, a also known as Tag, and another fellow, Luke Lemons. Mike Ostertag is a locomotive engineer for the Canadian National Railroad in Manitowoc, and Luke Lemons is a conductor on the Canadian National Railroad. And I first interviewed them uh, about three or four years ago on, uh, and it happened to be on valentine's day and i asked both of those guys i said so you're going out to get your wife's flowers eh? and they're both going no and i'm like whoa time out here boys <laughs> <laughs> and now here you are you forgot your 30th anniversary yeah and, well, you're, had, and you know, you're still alive yeah well with all with you know if you figure it out we had the pandemic i had to replace the refrigerator try and replace the refrigerator when you can't go shopping and it was tax day oh 
So I was just trying to pay my taxes, and then all of a sudden, my my lovely bride of thirty years handed me a a, a happy anniversary card, and y- you know, all of a sudden, the back of my mind go, I am so dead. Yeah, but I made up for I made up for it. We, I, you know, I got us. Uh, I made a nice surf and turf dinner. Um, you didn't. Uh, you'll never make up for that, Dave. No, no, I, I'm pretty sure that. Um, that uh, yeah. it'll be used against me in, in court. Yeah, somewhere along the way, that'll blow up in your face. Have you ever been to Salamanca? He was talking about the Southern Tier. Uh, I've driven through it. Uh, yeah. I've driven through most, most of the, I've stopped yeah. there. You're not, there gonna, is a, you're not going to be one of these annoying old guys that drives uh, 100 miles out of his way to avoid paying a $3 toll, are you? No, actually, I wanted to. I like that route because it's more scenic okay. than the throughway. And a lot, and, and a lot slower. And, uh, not the way I drive. Um, <laughs> what kind of car from New York? What kind of car you got? Well, at that point, I had a, um, I had the crew bus. I had a, um, what was it? It was a, I, I put it on my memory because it was, it was a lemon. But I had a, um, a Nissan um, Quest. Ah. with uh, twin sliding doors, the DVD system for my, uh, so whenever we would go somewhere, I'd load up the, you know, everybody we'd go there and I'd have an in-flight movie for them and they'd be watching like um, train videos or uh, a movie. Um, And the one thing about that quest that I could say, I could say is it likes going fast. And actually, if you got it up to um, slightly above the speed limit, it would sip gas. And if you were driving under 50, it would eat gas. And I could never figure this out, why it would be more fuel efficient running faster than slower. So I, 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 I thought you were going to say that you hit 88 miles an hour and disappeared into another uh, yeah. era. Yeah. Well, I was following, I, was, I did drive to Florida one time and I was behind a truck and I was just staying a certain distance from the truck. And at one point I looked down and I was over a hundred miles an hour. I think it was 106. And then I decided this was a little bit too fast. So I started slowing down and about 20 minutes later, the truck I was behind was pulled over. There you go. So if you have that inner voice that says, slow down, listen to it. Okay. Uh, we got to get onto these uh, boxes. How much time do we have left now? You're you're wearing me out, buddy. Oh man, we're a hundred. Oh, we're a hundred. <laughs> we're a hundred hours in. <laughs> hundred and six minutes. I would I would love to see if Dave could answer a question with one word. <laughs> I, I don't see that ever sure. happening. No, no, you know, you'll never. You couldn't do no, not a chance. Um, well, what if we do the Kelly questions with them? Oh my God. <laughs> that might be the longest one ever. <laughs> um, so, what's the deal with all these box cars? Uh, uh, let's see. Where, where, where? Help me. You've been to his. La- oh, before we go on, uh, grab yourself a little beverage, there, Dave. Uh, uh, Kaylee, you've been to his layout. Mm-hmm. How many times? Um, roughly. Half, but half a dozen, roughly. Okay, and so obviously you enjoy it over there. Mm-hmm. And the layout runs well, you said. Mm-hmm. And what's the operating sessions like? Um, well, I've actually visited more so than operated. I did operate once recently. And okay. it's um it, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot going on, but you're when you get a job, you're so focused, you don't really notice what's going on beside you. You're just kind of like into your job. Right. Um, and you're just focused and, and trying to get whatever you're whatever you're doing. So and I get well, the I get the sense that Dave's more interested, like he's uh, serious about operations. And while he's serious about it, I get the sense that he's more interested that you enjoy yourself rather than get it right. Would that be? Oh, it? absolutely, absolutely. That's that's for sure. Um, he'll he'll if you have any questions, he'll more, be more than happy to help you out. Give you uh, help give you get, get get you hints or work with you or just get you oriented or try to explain something and to see how the flow everything how your job fits into the bigger picture so um yeah but the most important thing is to make sure that you you're having a good time okay and so and how many people were there at the operating session roughly uh how about a dozen or so maybe 14 at one point and then a couple people bailed early all right Uh, okay and the rest of the time was on some sort of layout tour or something or just you were driving by and you went into dave's house without telling him or yeah there was a barbecue yeah, it was a uh, it was a July Fourth barbecue. Oh yeah, that, um, that Dave had um, broadcasted to um, 
close friends and family. And um, oh, I guess yeah, I, know, I, to... I guess I know where I fit in. You're always welcome to come by. <laughs> Let me know, and I'll throw you a personal operating session. Wow, that would be cool. Hey, yeah, bring the AML crew. Hey, before we go on, so uh, on Wednesday evenings we have um, a virtual chat room for our Patreon members. You know what Patreon is, Dave? You have no idea what Patreon is because you've only listened to three podcasts. For God's sakes, Dave. <laughs> Those are people that pay. Exactly. So anyways, uh, we have a virtual chat on Wednesday evenings, and we have people drop by and give us virtual tours of their layout. Would you like to do that one evening, one Wednesday evening? Sure. Not a problem. All right. You you seem, uh, you don't. I I sense hesitation. Yeah, I sense hesitation, too. I am a ham. I will be more than happy to show up and, and, um, and, broadcast from my layout and show you what's going on i just need time to hide all the beer bottles oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you got your stomach stapled you got to stop drinking beer buddy well i'm i i told kaylee this the last time and i don't tire of saying this i have become the ultimate cheap date one beer i'm done um half a potato and i'm done um un- the most unusual thing happened from the surgery I can eat Brussels sprouts. I never liked Brussels sprouts before, but now I love them. I can't get enough of them. And seafood is like the only food that I can eat and not have my stomach say stop. So, somebody, hence my cholesterol is nothing. Somebody I know is always trying to telling me how great Brussels sprouts are, and and she told me with a tiny tangy balsamic vinegar reduction, and I'm like, yeah, they're Brussels sprouts. How can they possibly? They probably taste like little balls and not grass is what they taste. Like. <laughs> no, no. If you ever see Brussels sprouts, the way they come out, they look like something the Klingons would have invented. Yeah. <laughs> They're Brussels. Yeah. I, here, I, I, this is Brussels sprouts, asparagus, cabbage, uh, any, th- any of these green little goofy vegetables. Eh, no, I don't get the point of it. I, I see cows eating them, but I mean, you know. <laughs> Uh, well, if you dice them up and put them in bacon, of course, bacon makes everything better. Yeah, so yeah, then, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oddly enough, my I, I, my wife is is of the uh, is my wife is Jewish. I'm not. I was uh, brought up uh, Protestant. And 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 let's she re- likes and bacon. Re- before and I can't stand it. She likes. And before we go on, let's remind everybody: your wife lost a bet. Uh, yeah, she married me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's catching on there, Lionel. Yeah, he's slowly. It's uh, t- t- taking a while. This is uh, this is going to be like a this is going to be like a a three beer guy. Um, so tell us uh, why. What is the deal with you've got twelve hundred box cars? Well, first off, how did you get involved in RPM meets? Like what? Uh, explain. All right, here's a good question for you, Dave. Uh, I got I got a couple of days left. Um, what is the thing with RPM meets? I'm fascinated by how successful RPM meets are because. They have no set. Uh, there's no uh, governing body. Uh, they're they're all over the country. Uh, everybody seems to really enjoy them. The thing I notice the most is uh, when you go there, you have to put your ego at. You have to park your ego at the door mostly, and they seem welcoming. Why are why? What is the deal with RPM meets? Why do they work so well? Well, it's basically takes you back to grade school. It's show and tell. You're bringing in your. Uh, what you've done and you're hoping for people's approval of what you, what you've accomplished at this point. Um, I've always used it um, as a sounding board for my crazy ideas. Uh, The very first RPM meet I went to um, at the time I was working for a company that did printouts printing. And so I print, I didn't know about this fabulous thing called PowerPoint. So I did an entire presentation using giant slides that I printed out at work. And everybody was like, like amazed about the detail that I went into. And um, my original concept was I was, and this is before I had a a better understanding of the word physics and engineering. Um, And I had presented it. And then I had one gentleman come up to me and said, that's a great idea. Except for the fact that it's not going to work. And he explained to me why it wouldn't work. And and again, you were talking about checking your ego at the door. It's very important because sometimes you may have an idea that will work, but you can't get it to work because the engineering is just not possible. 
uh, or it's not something that's going to be fluid enough for it to work in an op session. Um, we had an idea for a Gatling gun staging yard. And uh, what it basically was is you had eight 10-foot uh, long tracks that would be on a circular carriage. And you would basically stage the trains on these. Or the infamous staging elevator where you would basically would have this elevator go up and down again with a series of tracks. And you move the elevator up and down uh, to line up and you move them out and all that. And these were brilliant ideas that would have worked had I been a machinist. Or if any of my friends had been a machinist or had the ability to get it to work to the tolerance of model railroading of railroads need to have. Um, I don't know if you ever heard my or heard of my story about my wonderful rotary car float dumper. Mm -hmm. um, no. I had I had had a space issue and I have where where 33rd Street is and where 28th Street is, there's a pinch point. So I didn't want to have a pinch point because I was terrified of something happening and people having to funnel through a spot. Um, so I had developed this drawer uh, that would pull out and you would lay the car float in there. It worked. It worked beautifully, except for the fact it was highly unstable, which <laughs> idiot Dave, that was that's me before talking to people about the concept and figuring out that they had real bad drawbacks, uh, thought it would work and never realized that it's so unstable that as you're moving the cars onto the car float, the car float actually starts to sway in the pivot. And then uh, the concept of people who are much bigger than the car float brushing up against it never occurred to me. So, of course... In one op session, she dumped three loads of cars. Ooh. So 18 cars per load. Um, now, I have rubberized mats. Um, Atherin cars and Proto 2000 cars uh, will hit the ground. The doors will pop off or a couple will come off. Resin cars explode. Wow. <laughs> and that's a very expensive explosion because the average resin car is like 50, 60 bucks. And then uh, the hours, the hours it takes to build it. By the way, I am death to resin. Uh, I have built five resin cars. Not one has survived long enough to operate. I take that back. One has survived long enough to operate. Um, <laughs> it's that uh, that B and O wagon top with the waffle sides, and what? it's an F and C car. It's virtually indestructible. If I have it and I haven't broken it, it is. It'll survive anybody's layout. So I mean. Again, had I taken a step back and listened to somebody on that, I wouldn't have had all this um, happening at that point. And eventually what I did is what Kaylee got to see, which is uh, the uh, the furniture that I built that actually holds up the car float, which at its first operating session, somebody walked by it and got, caught the masonite that sheathes it and tore it. So... You could imagine what would happen if that was the car float the way it was back then. They would have just ripped the car float off out of its mooring. Right. So now it's on like some sort of carted, uh, like furniture. It's on a bolted on furniture that's never coming off. I've actually stubbed my toe on it and I thought I broke it. That's how bad, that's how sturdy this thing is. It's made out of two by fours. I build nothing weak. Okay. And because I've looked at your plan here while you were talking, and while well, I was waiting for you to take a breath, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> And okay, so it says uh, they're like temporary car floats, but they're not temporary anymore. No. Um, what was going to happen is I was originally going to have two or three car floats, and I was going to embed magnets into them and have this draped cloth that was going to go have uh, go over them that would also have magnets, and that would basically bolt down the cars because in real life they would use chain, and so of course I would scale that down to fabric. And that would allow you to walk around with a car float and not worry about dropping it. And um, what basically happened at that point is reality came in and um, no one really cares how the car got onto the car float because that's happening 45 minutes away in New Jersey in, in prototype land. Right. In operations land, um, when they finish the car float, 
I take the cars off by hand and put the new ones on. And I originally wanted to just swap out car floats. Um, there's only one person I know who actually does that and it works. And that's Jim Dahlberg on his layout. Okay. And he has a lot more open space and as Kaylee will attest, there's not that much open space around the car float. Um, so I decided that discretion was the better part of valor and just remove the cars by hand and put the cars on by hand at that point. Usually at that point, the guys are so tired and so happy that they finished the car float that they're having a beer or they're having a soda or they're using the bathroom or, or something like that. So as far as they're concerned, they don't see the sausage being made. Did you see the car float loaded again? Uh, let's see if we can uh, describe. I don't think we really describe to people very well exactly what your layout is. So it's basically uh the in downtown new york city mm -hmm. and it's, and what yeah. what year is it set in 1947 um mostly because that's the year my parents met okay. and they met in new york so when i was looking for an era i um sure uh, i was talking to my parents and i asked them when did you meet and they said 1947 and i'm like okay that's the year i'm gonna have my layout all right cool that's so more to nostalgia yeah, so this is not this is a primarily a switching layout. It's a mostly an industrial layout, primarily mm -hmm. switching of all sorts of switching and you know, and industry switching and stuff like that. Yes. It's um it runs um twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Um the each op session it breaks up a twenty four hour period into twelve hours. Um it runs at a two point five to one fast clock. Um that's the model railroading portion of it. The um, for the New York Central, I use waybills. Um, for the car float yards, I use uh, switch lists, which are done on a computer. Um, I've actually refined it a little bit more now that I actually give you a, a snapshot of what the yard should look like when you're done. And because uh, there's some cars that don't get moved, so people kept on asking the questions: Is this car is not on the list? Is it doesn't move? And no matter how many times I said that, it just never. You know, just because I understand the concept doesn't mean the person operating it for the very first time will get the concept. Right. So, and that's a, that's, if you take away anything from listening to my, listening to me on a podcast or listening to an RPM meet, uh, the most important thing is, is that people will pick up what you grant them to pick up. And just because you understand the concept doesn't mean that everybody in the room understands your concept. And if they don't grasp it, it's not their fault. It's your fault. So I've always, um, I've always felt that communications is my strong point because <laughs> I've always, I've always had to deal with, uh, instructing people on highly sure. technical and complex pieces of equipment on how to use it. So you were mentioning Legos before. I, I break computers down to Legos, especially re repairs and stuff like that. And when you do it to that level and you and you treat people with the intellect of you could understand this, you just have to be willing to think outside the box, you get a lot better results. Well, and you sound to me like a guy that enjoys having people learn the puzzle that you're trying to present to them. I mean, you sound to me like you enjoy the the interaction between personalities and and having pe and having people share your enthusiasm. Yeah, I, I do that a lot. Like one of the things I play with a lot is that um, there is a uh, there's a layout that had personality cards that you would have to get. It was at uh, um, oh god, I can't, I can't remember his name, but he had the Chillicothe uh, subdivision. And he had these cards you would have to pick up, and there were like things that happened. And one of the things that I understand about the railroad in New York City from talking to Jim Kosovo and to a couple other people who actually ran the prototype was that the Erie was not happy when the High Line was built because they cut off the New York Central from coming down 10th Avenue. I'm sorry, 11th Avenue. And now they cross the Erie at 12th Avenue, which is uh, on the water. And so now where the Erie used to be able to run across the street and go to the car float and pick up stuff. Now here was the New York central coming in and um, interrupting their operations and stuff like that. And one of the things that I enjoy doing is sometimes I don't have to plant the seed, but sometimes I will plant the seed and I say, well, you know, those are your diamonds. They have to ask you for your permission to cross those diamonds. There's a pair of diamonds that the New York central has to cross. And in the New York Central, guys will know this, and inevitably, once or twice 
a year, sometimes three times a year, the New York Central guy turns into a jerk and leaves boxcars on the diamonds ah. so that he could work terminal stores and Erie can't block them. And sometimes the Erie does the same thing because the Erie has there's two diamonds. The Erie could block one without having to interrupt its its uh, its work and all that. Um, so it gets quite interesting because they start arguing over. No, it's my diamonds. No, I have to have be able to get across and work this stuff. And so it gets really interesting because because as they say, the jerk quotient gets high at that point. <laughs> That'd be a perfect job for me. <laughs> um okay so uh how do you circulate these 1200 cars around the layout how do you keep track of that well one of the things that i do is that like i said like i said before it runs off of an actual schedule uh i was very lucky i found the holy grail i found a 1947 new york central freight schedule an employee timetable that basically say where the cars come from so i at the end of of a full session I pull all the cars off, they get inspected, they get cleaned, and they uh, basically get put into bins from what location they come from. Um, I then have these waybills that basically will ask for a Pennsylvania car. I don't care what car, it's got to be a box car, so I look for a Pennsylvania car. Pull it out, build it together, and I start building building the next set of trains that are coming out, and that goes into staging. Um, I give priority to cars that have not run yet. So anything that has not run in the previous session is in one set of bins. Anything that has run is in a different set of bins. Uh, when I do the car float yards, I grab from the stuff that has run off the central. And so that they, they're getting new cars. And uh, I have a map that was published in, God help me, I had to read an accounting book on how to figure this out. Um, I don't recommend it. But it's actually quite interesting if you get interested in the paperwork side of it. And in the accounting book, they give you routing tables. They say basically cars from this region, with, let's say six, would include Santa Fe, uh, Southern Pacific, Pacific Electric, and all this. So if you have a load that's coming from, let's say, L.A., because the way bills say where it's coming from and what railroad it should be coming from, but I'm out of cars for that railroad, I could pick a car this close and using this as a guide and using my um my tracking basically just segregating the cars by what ran and what has to run now i i come up with uh with the circulation pattern now there's some cars that are in captured service so they'll be the same cars same type of cars like uh, I have the pacemaker cars, so those that runs on a specific train. So there'll always be pacemaker cars running together as a unit train. All right. Um, there's some flower cars that were in captured service. They were just, uh, sorry, English is optional. Captured service. Yeah. That run between uh, Buffalo and New York. Uh, these were going to Nabisco, so I had to print my own decals and find my own decals for um, uh, Toronto, Hamilton, and Buffalo flower cars. There's a wonderful manufacturer of decals for those that I found uh, that's in St. Catharines, and I was able to order those decals. Um, the the terrible thing about 1947 is all the really cool paint schemes have not yet arrived. Oh. So they're all plain Jane. They're all very bland. Um, the cars should look like um, – like they haven't been taken care of for a while because they haven't because of World War II. There was some, there's a lot of cosmetic stuff would be happening with them because if you look at the year 1947, uh, the railroads had just placed massive orders for uh, box cars and passenger equipment. So a lot of, in my case, a lot of the box cars would be on their last legs. How long does it take and, you to, how long does it take you to a uh, stage for a, an operating? It sounds like a very massive job. Well, it depends on the music I'm playing, but usually about a night or two. Okay, and what music? I, I I rock out. I put I, I I go to I go to my uh, I have an Alexa. By the way, the Alexa on my in my basement will actually turn the railroad on and off because I programmed it to do that. But uh, I, I'll I'll tell Alexa to play some uh, some Rolling Stones. If I'm playing Vangelis, it's going to take me forever because I mellow out and I sit there and I think too much. If I'm playing the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. Or 1970s disco music because I was a kid of the 70s or stuff like that. The Bee Gees, I I, um, I I tend to work a little bit faster. 
I yeah. think subconsciously, I just want to get it over with at that point. Do you have any video of you dancing to the Saturday Night no, Fever? No, nobody wants to see. Nobody wants to see that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what kind of? And if anybody does, I charge nine ninety nine an hour, and I will be more than happy to do a live webcast. You know you. what? We could put that on Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> could be what you get for your ten dollars a month is you get yeah. to you get to watch suddenly, Dave dancing. Suddenly, the lake picture does not seem that bad. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. Yeah, see, all I'm doing is standing there. Um, uh, Dave, what kind of uh, uh control system do you use? Well, I use NCE. I have uh, the NCE wireless. And then um, Kaylee was here for the inaugural run of the Raspberry Pi 4 uh, running JMRI for the Wi-Fi throttles, which I had a terrible time with because unlike the, the, the 3B, the wireless kept on um, resetting itself. So people were getting kicked off of it. So I'm um, currently rebuilding that so it'll be of a higher quality than just using the out of the box um jmri build right so i'm doing it from scratch but i use everything from you know your apple or your um android uh handle throttle that you would use there most people like that I have chargers all over the room for that uh, but mostly everything is nce um i've also well, one of the clinics i do is do it yourself dcc so i've actually built um, an Arduino based DCC plus plus system. And, uh, I use that for programming. So I don't have to be in the basement. I could be upstairs with the wife and the kitties to program stuff. Uh, although they yell at me because the locomotives are too loud when they're out of the box until I quiet them down. Either that or they're yelling at you because you're upstairs. One or the other. Yeah. That one or the other. And, uh, <laughs> one of these days I'm going to get into 3d printing. It's just, um, I haven't decided whether I wanted a 4k TV more than I want a 3d printer. Oh, okay. There you go. Uh, Kaylee has a 3D printer. Did you get it working yet, Kaylee? Uh, it's working. Now I'm aware or not I'm getting prints out of it. That's a different story. Okay. Well, here's the most important thing about 3D printers. 3D printers are fantastic, but if you don't know how to program and how to do draw in 3D and have a good slicing program that slices up for the printer to understand. It's a nice honor. It's a nice ornament at that point. That's the reason why I haven't invested in one, because I know I can do it. Because I learned how to do three dimensional CAD work when I was in in college, but that was thirty years ago. And the system I learned how to use is was Unix based. So I'm pretty sure it's the technology has changed since then. Do you know what CAD stands for? Computer aided design. No, Canadian dollar. Oh, that too. <laughs> So, hey, Dave, I got one last question for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you seem like you're a, you, you're very enthusiastic about the hobby. Yes, yes. You, you've enjoyed it immensely. You enjoy the people. You enjoy the community. Have you ever heard of the AML Nation? That's not the question. But have you ever heard of the AML Nation? I've seen it on Facebook. I've seen your, your, um, the people that follow you. And I'm actually, you're an inspiration for, for me. I just want to say this out front. But, uh, I've been watching... Uh, what you've gone through and a lot of people would have given up and you, uh, I, I enjoy your countdown and, you know, not in a countdown, count, count up yeah. uh, what you've been doing with your life. Um, and um, it gives me inspiration. It was actually part of my motivation for getting myself health, healthy. Well, there you go. So it was well worth me sticking it out then. Yes, it is. It is. And it's, it's important because a lot of times people have the defeatist attitude of, I oh, don't know. I don't want to go through this. I don't really want to eat soup for a month. By the way, you have to eat soup for a month, or broth, Ooh. after you have the surgery. So, um, yeah, well, you have to you have to be inspired by by people who have issues and have overcome them, and basically basically laugh at them and and move on. And I'm I'm very proud to have been able to speak to you and 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 to let you know that it it is inspiring and it is important for people to to see a success of that diseases and illnesses can't take the humanity away from people. Well, thank you very much. And I'm proud of what you've done too, because that's a big, that's a big decision to make. I think it's the hardest part would be making the decision and then mm -hmm. moving forward from that. So anyways, uh, you need to become part of the AML nation, buddy, your perfect uh, material. I got a feeling you and I are going to be uh, friends uh, from here on in. We're going to, we're going to be more than just acquaintances. We're going to be friends. 
But I'm looking forward to it. How do too. I sign up? Uh, well, there's a there's a, a screening process, so we still have to go through that. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I thought you were just going to route into the Patreon page. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, for ten bucks a month, I can be your friend. <laughs> uh, you know what, Dave? I appreciate everything you said, and uh, and I I I, re- I really do, but. It's pretty much it comes down to you just got to keep put one foot in front of the other and just don't quit. And yeah, that's you, and that's a great thing. What I was leading up to is you you really enjoy the community of model railroading, which we all do. And uh, so my million dollar question to you is uh, what's happening with the hobby? Is it dying, growing, shrinking? What's happening? I think it's growing in leaps and bounds. I think that uh, the addition of 3D printers and the um, the the ability for people to do Arduino and um, Raspberry Pi based technology to basically um, break through these barriers of technology is going to lead a lot of excitement in the next few years. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of people who are now have businesses who started doing. Um, I need this for my car float. I need this for my uh, float bridge. And all of a sudden, now it's a business of selling stuff. Um, the sign of a healthy industry and a healthy uh, model railroading uh, life is not whether or not Ather and Atlas are doing really well. It's whether or not they are mom and pa businesses that are thriving. And I think that there are a lot of mom and pa businesses that are thriving because let's face it, Companies like Atlas, Ather, and Proto 2000, and all these companies cannot do everything. Yeah, you know, that's a good point. There's, there's a guy called JJL who had the HA660s for years before uh, Atlas came out with them. There's a lot of companies that you know that come out and have the niche market and have these products that every, you know people want. Uh, and by the way, if anybody out there has has ideas of bringing out Deal and W Camelbacks, let me know because that's a possible replacement for the New York Harbor. But you didn't hear that from me. But um, there's a lot of things that people want that in the old days you had to be able to be able to fabricate them yourselves uh, or have the machinist skills to do them. Where the 3D technology, where you get a kid or or an older adult who who did this for a living uh, and now is turning it a passion into a business or a passion into something that becomes a business despite what they want. Uh, I think it's a very uh, promising future. Uh, the only, the only caveat about that is the economy and whether or not, and I think that that there's no downside of that. I think it's going to, it's going to continue, especially because with the 3d printing world. And now that you get 3d printed electronics and, uh, I think in the future, you're going to start seeing um, these mom and pop businesses filling the niches that uh, the big companies just can't do. And uh, if you're a big company, don't be threatened by them because they're filling a need that you that you just don't have the time or the resources to fulfill. Yeah. And you should be fostering it because the more people that get into it, that's a bigger talent pool for you to draw on. I think, too, also... 3D printing is going to draw people more back to kit building and model building because, you know, there's going to be things that they can buy pieces and parts for and put things together. And uh-huh. I, think, I think that's going to in, increase the the uh, hands-on part of the hobby myself. Yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things, oddly enough, because I went to college and I, I, I took design engineering as a major, um, I pay attention to s- silly things like brick. Um, so when I was looking at some models and all that, and I was talking to branch line when they did their firehouse, uh, model, this is years ago, they did the firehouse and the gentleman from branch line was there. He says, can you spot the arrow? And I said, I looked at it for a few minutes. I said, yeah, this is a veneer brick. It should be, um, the, the brick that should be on the building should be a structural brick. And he looked at me, he says, you, you had to take this some type of design course because, uh, when you, when you look at a brick building, um, the near brick basically has a running bond and just has brick for brick's sake. It's just there to be decorative. It's not there for any structural means. But in the 19th century, when they did that, the brick walls were like in the case of um, terminal stores, eight to 10 feet thick. It was a fireproof building. So they had to tie each layer of brick into 
the next layer. And so the way they did that, if you look at a building that's actually structurally made out of brick and it's not a veneer, you'll see you'll see a pattern of bricks along way, long ways and you'll see bricks edgeways. And those are basically the bricks are tying the two layers together. And that is a mistake a lot of people make when they build a building. And only somebody who is engineering experience or a builder would would catch that. But the guys at Branch Line, when they did that, they were just wanted to get the 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 look right, and then they were going to fix that, and they did. But it was sort of like a contest to see if anybody could figure out what was wrong with the with the prototype. And um, those little things, again, that's that's a niche thing that somebody um, who's got a passion for it and is working off of photographs, like uh, like I said, uh, my uh, terminal storage building is a massive building it's six feet by 15 inches by about 20 inches so at any scale unless you're o scale or g scale that's a big building yeah and um and that's one eventually um i don't know when if i have the time and the money and the resources to actually build it i'll build it it's got over a thousand windows so even at a dollar a window is a thousand dollars worth of windows so it's, 3d it's 3d print them there you go that's the plan. Uh, the big thing is I have to become pro, uh, proficient with it. And uh, Dave, I got bad yeah. news. I got bad news for you. Sure. You have to stop talking now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No problem. But if you want to do the Kelly questions uh, after this, you'll have the opportunity to talk some more. Sure. All right. Did your head hurt? My hands no, hurt. Just... All the notes. Oh uh, yeah, okay. uh, Dave. Did your head hurt? Never. Uh, Kaylee, how about you? Still processing. I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, yeah. Mine's uh, mine. Mine hurts, man. That was a lot of information, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to be on the podcast again, and then if you listen to it, or, or if you listen to your podcast and the Kelly questions, you'll have listened at least five times, and you'll be an official fan. Well, I've listened to the Kelly questions for Dave. All right. So you got. I think for I think for Phil, Phil, I was crying about because I was like, Phil, just. Play the game. Yeah, yeah. Phil is a pain in the butt. Let's face it. Phil is a pain in the butt. Nice guy. Got yes. me tickets to a Broadway show. Uh, spam a lot. A really nice guy. But oh, real, on, on the on the podcast, pain in the butt. I have to tell you, I saw spam a lot. You can't tell me. Yeah, you can't tell I, me. You're done talking. But this is funny because <laughs> I went to see it and I couldn't uh, understand why people were offering me five hundred dollars a seat. I had two seats to see it because I didn't realize it was the last uh, show. That was it. It was done. Uh, and standing behind me, the entire show, the entire spam a lot was Eric Idle. Wow! And I didn't know whether to watch the stage or to watch him because there's my childhood idol standing literally standing behind me. And spam a lot on the stage. And at the end of the, the show, the original cast, with the exception of Tim Curry, because he was very ill, was in the audience. Perfect. So as a big Python fan, that was, that's it. I won. <laughs> now my head still hurts even more. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, Tylenol, Tylenol and, and scotch. Yeah, yeah. Um. So if uh, people want to check out Dave's, uh, uh, you go to Facebook and you check out the uh, New York Central Harbor Railroad, yeah. or you go to uh, his website, which is uh, N as in Nick, Y as in Yankee, H as in Harry, and R R N Y H R R dot com, and that's his uh, that's his website for his layout. And uh, Dave, you sound like a good guy. I I can hardly wait to meet you in person. Well, if you're ever in Clifton or if I'm ever in, if they Canada opens the border to us uh, Americans, um, I'm more than happy to come back. I am looking forward to going to Toronto in a big way. I really, really, I love that city. Okay. But could I just meet you at Nurpum? Wouldn't that be? Absolutely. Or Springfield? No problem. If there is a Springfield. And you know what? I'll be doing, well, yeah, there will be again someday. It's not over. Like, we're not ending it forever. Okay, like try to relax. It's gonna everybody try to relax. Everything's coming back. Maybe it's gonna be a little longer than we want, but it's all coming back. Um, the uh, the point is, and you know what, Dave? When I drive to Springfield or I drive to Nurpum, you know how I'm gonna go? Right down Interstate 90, mm -hmm. right down the throughway. I'll pay the tolls. I'll pay that. I'll pay that 16 bucks and be darn proud of it. 
I won't give Mer- uh, Andrew Cuomo any money. <laughs> Have you thought of a hobby at all, Dave? Yeah, actually, if you ever- <laughs> no more talking, yeah. Dave. Dave, take no more talking. It's the most beautiful road now, in New York State. I've driven all over New York State. I I, I only lived a, an hour north of Toronto. I don't live in in, in Winnipeg, Manitoba. You know, it's uh, it only takes me seven and a half hours to get to Springfield by car down the throughway. I don't live that far away, Dave. It's an hour and a half to fly to New York City. Hey, Kaylee, I made it to Springfield in two and a half hours. Well, okay. Wow. I can, wow. I, I made it to wow. the, I made it to, to, to Detroit in three and a half. So, and you want a prize? What? I had to go. <laughs> <laughs> um. And by the way, we have several uh, 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 state patrol uh, officers listening. So good luck. Uh, so Kaylee, can you give out our email address? Sure. For those who want to uh, chime in on whether the uh, New York Thruway is uh, worth the tolls or if there's a <laughs> route to take, uh, feel free to send us an email at modelerslife at gmail.com. That's modelers with one L like New York Highline, not two L's like in tolls. There you go. And yes, please adorn us with your stories of trying to avoid tolls. I love those guys. That's like my favorite thing. Yeah, I didn't pay that fifteen dollars. Took me. I drove it. I only had to drive two hundred miles out of my way, but I didn't pay that fifteen bucks. Uh, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was here for a whole day before you got here. Uh, <laughs> um, and we have a website, a modelerslife dot com. If you go there, you're going to see all kinds of stuff about the podcast. And we have yeah, there's a picture of uh, Bruce, a moderately agitated male boy in a particularly agitated state. And if you just click on that picture, if you don't remember the email address that Kaylee just gave you, you just click on that picture, and automatically you can send us an email. And also, you can click on the Patreon thing and slide over there. And for five bucks a month, you can double your fun with the AML podcast, the Modelers Life podcast. And finally, we have, uh, we also on there, where there's a picture of Ron's Trains and Things, who is the official videographer of A Modeler's Life. And he, that's where we have all of our how-to videos is over there on Ron's Trains and Things. Uh, Ron Marsh, he runs that. And he's got like 30,000 subscribers and he's had 2 million views. So he's a great guy. So go on over there. I think that's it. I think we've covered everything. I think so. All right. That's all. Yeah. All right, Dave. We got a job for you, buddy. <laughs> no problem. Uh, and I got I got ten bucks. Says you can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a chance you're going to be able to do this. Um, at the end, at the appropriate moment, you're going to have to say "Happy Rails" to you. Okay, I can do that. All right. We'll see. Uh, well, Dave, as we close the barn doors on another episode of A Modeler's Life. And the sun slowly sets over the back 40. I guess there's nothing else left to do except for you to say. Happy trails to you. (laughs) Somebody owes me 10 bucks. (laughs) Until we meet again. Uh, We got two rules here. Uh, No singing. No singing. And uh, it's rails, not trails. Oh, okay. Happy rails to you. All right, I'll say it again. Happy rails to you. Yeah, not yet, Dave. (laughs) Thank you, Marker. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Dave, as we close the barn doors on another episode of A Modeler's Life and the sun slowly sets over the back 40, I guess there's nothing else left to do except for you to say... Happy rails to you. Busted Knuckle, guests of a Modeler's Life podcast, stay at the Casa del Sol, Motocorton Inn, where late night dancing at the Rumber Room is a magical event to be experienced. It's another Lincoln Homer.
Lionel, you got a lot of explaining to do, Lionel. Ah, mira qué pasa aquí, está haciendo toda la cosa aquí. 